Hi, I'm, um, I'm Pam Hess with United Press International. And uh, uh, there's been a recurring theme today, which is the Bush policy in the Balkans. Um, I'm wondering if you could straighten us out on that. During the uh, campaign, uh, many of us were under the impression that what he was talking about was a withdrawal of troops orderly over a, a certain amount of time, but definitely a withdrawal of troops. And now in the transition, the, um, the public statement is, well, we're going to review all of the deployments and, and just see. So uh, was it ever the intention of the Bush administration um, to withdraw troops and has that changed? Or was it never the intention and, and we misunderstood? Could you put that up? Well, let me tell you what um, then Governor Bush said um, and what remains his policy, which is that he believes that it is important to review uh, American deployments um, in various parts of the world uh, but that any review of any uh, deployments would take place in the context of alliance consultation, that any uh, review would take place taking account of commitments that we have already made and of fulfilling those commitments uh, in coordination with our allies. And that has not changed and that continues to be the policy today. Mohammed Sutuhi, Egyptian TV9 News Channel. Uh, I have a question about the Middle East. Um, are you going to build on uh, President Clinton's uh, list proposals uh, on the Middle East or just start from the beginning? And um, uh, concerning Iraq, um, I have a question about uh, your policy, your vision uh, about the situation in Iraq. Uh, are you going to try to replace President Saddam the way uh, maybe uh, Mr. Powell uh, hinted in his uh, uh, New, uh, speech uh, accepting nomination or um, uh, sanctions, uh, are you going to continue them forever if President Saddam continues to survive yet another administration? On the Middle East, let me be very clear, there's one President of the United States until January 20th and I think that uh, President-elect Bush uh, believes that until he is actually President of the United States, he's not going to start making foreign policy. Uh, President Clinton uh, is uh, involved in uh, Middle East policy and uh, it is our view that until President-elect Bush is President of the United States, the Middle East is, we're not going to make any, any statements about uh, what we will do. Um, on Iraq, I think it's been very clear and I believe you would see in uh, the testimony that Secretary Powell gave that um, our belief is that the Saddam Hussein remains a tremendous threat to the region. Uh, that uh, there has to be pressure brought on him, continuous pressure brought on him to live up to the obligations that he undertook at the end of the Gulf War, that uh, the sanctions regime um, needs to be reinforced and strengthened, and uh, that it will be the goal of this administration to make certain that we deal with Saddam Hussein in a way that is consistent with the tremendous threat that he remains to his neighbors, including uh, the p potential uh, that he is continuing to try to develop weapons of mass destruction. Um, I think that that's probably uh, what it's wise to say at this point, and uh, at some point in time it'll be clear uh, what else may be in store. Uh, Mike Jenkins, uh, Human, Human Rights Hello. Watch. Yes, uh, over here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Tim Barber, The Washington Times. Um, the, uh, there's been some concern about uh, the uh, possible arm sales to the decision on arm sales to Taiwan. I just wondered if you move forward with that. And, uh, and just as a second question, I've heard that um, the non-political staffers at the National Security Council have been told that they're going to have to leave. I wonder what the reason for that is. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're referring to in the second case. Uh, the NSC staff is, as it always is, uh, a mixture of people who will stay to fulfill details and a mixture of people who will be brought in uh, from the outside and nothing has changed uh, as far as I know through practice of NSC staff for some time, to, uh, for some time in the past. Uh, in terms of the um, arms sales to Taiwan, uh, that is not yet an issue. It will come up on the hill and we'll uh, cross that bridge when we get to it. The uh, one thing that we'll say is that uh, President-elect Bush, uh, as he made clear when he was uh, running for office, uh, believes that he has certain obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act and uh, that he's going to fulfill those obligations. Mike Kendrick, Human Rights Watch. Two questions on trade policy, one general, the other specific. 
Uh, late last week, I was in the Silicon Valley at a conference on trade policy in the 21st century in which there were discussions about the role of international labor standards and environmental standards in trade regimes. And I'd just be interested in your general comment on that issue. And then a specific question about China's entry into the WTO. As China joins the WTO, what do you think can be done to encourage greater adherence to international labor standards as well as to create social safety nets for millions of unemployed workers who are going to lose their jobs? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, China's entry into the WTO, uh, I think our belief is, will be good for uh, China and good for world trade. Good for China, uh, not only because it will open, uh, because principally it will open the economy. And in opening the economy, uh, will ultimately also probably help to open the politics. Now, out of all of that, I think that you get a system that will likely be more responsive to labor uh, issues and more responsive to its citizens. It is increasingly the case with China that fewer Chinese citizens are, fewer and fewer Chinese citizens are um, beholden to the Chinese government for their livelihood. And that is a very uh, good development, and I would expect that to continue. Um, around the world, uh, the uh, importance of increased attention to environmental standards uh, to environmental degradation, I think, is something that everybody takes seriously. It's a question of how to get it done. Uh, certainly, working conditions are something that everyone wants to see improved. It is probably the case that prosperous countries do better on both scores, and so part of the uh, goal is to improve the prosperity of uh, countries around the world where these have been problems. Uh, and also, I would say, to enhance democracy around the world, because when you have democratic governments, you have greater attention and greater scrutiny on issues like labor standards and uh, environmental policy. I would just cite that back in the 70s, there was always this thought that somehow uh, collectivist societies might better protect the environment than uh, capitalist societies. And when the Soviet Union broke up, uh, we realized that the important variable was democratic societies which have uh, an open press, which have the possibility for organization around uh, interest groups around environmental standards tend to protect the environment better. Dr. Rice, uh, Scott Thompson from the Fletcher School and the Board of Directors of the Peace Institute. I am just off a plane from Manila where the greatest uh, challenge to democracy and uh, coherence is being fought out in the streets as we speak. Um, you spoke of values like democracy and you spoke of um, allies. I was told by a close confidant of this person called President Estrada that he will use the inaugural activities here on Saturday as a smokescreen to end the turbulence by declaring martial law and closing down the parliament. I'm wondering if you have um, contingent plans for dealing with what might well be uh, your first small crisis. Well, thanks, Scott, for the warning. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> Look, I don't think I can speculate on, on what may or may not happen in the Philippines. Obviously, a very important place, but I think it's probably better not to speculate. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Rice, can you please clarify the mystery of the publication in the New York Times two days ago? There was an article claiming that President George W. Bush is going to change American policy toward Russia and conduct a very hard line poll. And then there was the text of the interview. And I didn't find in the text of the interview anything which was supporting this claim. So whom should I trust? The text <laughs> of the interview of the New York Times. <laughs> oh, Sergey, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Uh, let me just say that headline writers, uh, with all due respect to headline writers, don't always reflect the, the substance of what is in an article. Um, I think that President-elect has made it very clear that he expects to have a fruitful professional relationship with Russia, uh, that it is a country with which we have many um, interests in common, many uh, concerns and uh, areas of, of uh, conflict, and that we'll just have to work through it in a business-like fashion. It is, by the way, in everybody's interest to see a uh, democratic, uh, prosperous, hopefully market-oriented uh, Russia emerge. And uh, everyone should hope for that day. But uh, I don't think that uh, words like a, more, a harder line or a more confrontational approach toward Russia uh, would 
would characterize uh, his thinking. So I should subscribe to the Washington Post. <laughs> Uh, Trudy Rubin, the Philadelphia Inquirer. At an earlier session, we were discussing what you might have meant by the words, uh, the U.S. doesn't want to be the world's 911. And I wonder if you could yourself elaborate a little bit whether you, this means you rule out peacekeeping operations, you think there should be a different kind of body that does them, uh, what you think about the idea of uh, Kofi Annan's idea about U.N. peacekeeping being bolstered, whether you think regional organizations could work, who will do it if we don't do it, and will we ever do it? Mm -hmm. I don't think you rule out uh, a priori uh, anything. The President of the United States ought to have at his disposal instruments uh, that can be tailored and fit to the circumstances that he faces at any particular point in time. Uh, this simply came in the context of um, the question of making certain that we're not trying to do everything that we're not trying to be every place at every point in time, uh, that perhaps we do develop with others ways of managing crises of this kind, including with regional powers. Uh, we've all spoken, I think, positively about uh, the East Timor model, uh, where Australia was able to, to uh, carry most of the load with some American help um, of the uh, model in which is perhaps is emerging with Nigeria uh, in Sierra Leone. But I think the important point is that it is that the United States really can't afford to go it alone here. Uh, we, there are places where we have strong alliances, like in NATO, where we have an infrastructure for doing things that we don't have in other parts of the world. And as we become more concerned about other parts of the world, I think we have to give um, and, and defocus, if you will, on just the Soviet threat, which gave us the infrastructure in Europe. I think that uh, we have to begin to think about what kind of infrastructure, what kind of coalitions, uh, what kind of relationships we need to de develop in other parts of the world.